Can't be an orgasm. Okay. I, what, like, uh, if I was brutally murdering you, how, how, like, if I was stabbing you in the chest. Oh, <laughs> fuck! <laughs> oh, stop! You're smiling way too much for me to be, <laughs> stab- <laughs> me to be stabbing you in the chest. So good. Oh. <laughs> it's my last breath. How long have you been oh. to BDSM for? Pardon? How long have you been in a BDSM for? <laughs> Shit, how'd you fucking know? <laughs> Three weeks. <laughs> I'm, I'm dabbling, I'm yeah. dabbling. Well, I can get the no, silence, eh? Hey? You just keep rolling. Yeah, just keep going. Welcome back to another episode of Inside the Mind of On Carl BTV, brought to you by Moby Tech Queensland, the number one mobile computer company in the world, as long as you live north of Brisbane. My guest today is Todd Jarrett. Did I pronounce that right? Yeah. Let's go. Oh, it sounds like it's spelled. The amount of names I've stuffed up. I, mean, I thought you like were I, going just then. Well, I am. Oh, yeah. You're going. Do you yeah, I, I still <laughs> have 10 seconds of silence. <laughs> Glenn, Glenn's grabbed it. Glenn's okay, grabbed okay, it. Okay, I'm like on a whole different page. I'm like, okay, wait for the silence. We like to uh, catch our guests off guard. <laughs> yeah, so we, good. <laughs> no, I was going to say the amount of names get wrong in this program. It's embarrassing. So I'm glad it's spelled the way it sounds. Yeah, Jarrett. Yeah, that's yeah. beautiful. Most people give it like E-double-T or E-T, but yeah. A-double-T, rat. Yeah, right, Jarrat. Yeah. Jarrat. Yeah. Jarrat. 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 Todd Jarrat. Yeah, it kind of sounds a little bit French when you're like, Jarrat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's literally, Jarrat. It's literally Jarrat. Uh, <laughs> Todd, I'm very happy to have Todd on the program. Uh, one of my good friends, Steele, shout out to Steele, who I have played footy with maybe once or twice based on our injuries, uh, but we've, we've had a couple of games together. I recommended uh, that I reach out to Todd. So Todd has, has done a ton of work on the Sunshine Coast and, and uh, obviously uh, throughout a, a bigger area than the Sunshine Coast. Please delete all of that. I don't know what I'm trying to say here. Um, but uh, is a part of a, a, co- like a group, a collective, would you call it? Um. It's, it's a brand, I'd say yeah. now. Like, yeah, Rue, Rue McKenzie and Ryan Hubbard, two Kiwi boys, yep. they actually started it, Cool To Be Conscious. And from there, it, they started having others that wanted to join as facilitators of breath work and everything. And, yeah, from there it kind of grew. I had nothing to do with them to begin with. Sure. And then it kind of happened by flow of where I'm at and what I'm doing in life and everything. So, yeah. yeah it's cool to hear. Like, you, you hear – I went out to Ocean Street for like the third time I've ever gone out. I've only recently moved up to Sunshine Coast or a couple of years ago. And um, I heard a couple of girls talking about this group of people that go to the beach and do breath work and your name, Todd. Oh, there we like, go. This is the boy. This is I know this guy, man. I'm about to talk to this guy. <laughs> like oh. you're, you're the guy. So I, like it, it would, it's cool that – cool to be conscious is obviously this thing that is uh, – this movement that's oh, accelerating on the Sunshine Coast, yeah. obviously everywhere else too. Yeah, all over and the that world. You're, you're a big part of that. That's really cool. Yeah. So the context to it was <clears throat> I went down to uh, – the Goldie a few months ago now, I think it was June or July. And I went down there to basically hang out with some friends and catch up just for a weekend to get away. And went out Saturday night to a, a, like a red carpet party, which was uh, a guy's like podcast launch, actually uh, Morgan Nelson. And, uh, there was just these a massive crew of conscious entrepreneurs. Like they were obviously dressed up all fancy and wearing the name brand stuff because they're obviously very wealthy, but the conversation was quite, you know, aware and it wasn't about all of the material items. It was like, how can we impact more people? And yes, they were getting financial return, but the focus was impact. And I was like, this is sick. And then from that, the next day I went down to Burley beach and dropped in at stillness. I had no idea really what it was. Um, But the friends that I were staying with, they were regulars and they said, hey, come do it with us. I was like, I'll do anything. Like I'll try anything because I'd been uh, introduced to breath work early last year with my health journey. And we went down and I was just, holy shit, 
like this is nuts. Just the feeling that was created within, you know, an hour, the connection, the breath, the meditation. I went and spoke to the facilitators afterwards. A shout out to Rach Chi. Um, we went and spoke for quite a bit afterwards. I was just so pulled to to speak to her. And then, you know, we had the rest of our day. And then that Sunday night, I was laying in bed. And I guess the challenge I'd have living on the sunny coast actually was I moved up at the end of my uni degree. So start of 2017 to train athletes, to consult with athletes, to teach at the university and to um, teach um, PT courses, educate basically in that space. And I was up there, you know, the from t- start of 2017 through till, you know, mid this year. And I never felt like I actually had like a family or a community. And I felt like I was a very small fish in a moderately large pond, like no one knew me or no one had heard of me. And you're kind of like walking around, you just feel like this little, little guy, not knowing anyone as well. I didn't feel like I knew anyone other than the small kind of group of associates that I'd created from my own, you know, businesses and the clients and whatnot. And, and then after I'd been down to the Goldie, I was laying in bed that Sunday night and I was like, I'm moving to the fucking Gold Coast. Like there's guys here that I love their yeah. vibe. This is sick. This is epic. Like the sunny coast has nothing for me. But what the, what's going on there? It's just a bunch of, it's like slow pace. <laughs> and I wanted to be more into that. I was moving back into my masculine after being in the, you know, the health journey, which no doubt we'll chat a little bit about, but I'd been in this space of resting and healing for around like 18 months. And I was so committed. I was like, okay, I'm going to look up where I can move into and, and whatnot. And, and then I kind of had this moment of, well, I've got my lease for another eight months on the sunny coast. Do I just hang on to that and kind of continue? And then there was this, fuck, are you going to just like sit here and, and sort of want to go to the Gold Coast and can sort of in a way like complain that there wasn't anything going on at the sunny coast? And I was like, you know what, fuck it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to be the guy. I'm going to create a community on the sunny coast. And so – I just put up an Instagram story, literally laying in bed that night. I was like, I'm going to do some breathwork and meditation down on the beach next Sunday. You're welcome to join. And I literally set it up down the end of my street and started at eight o'clock. So I was like, I don't need to get up too early yeah. and I don't have to go too yeah. far. It's like such oh a, God. yeah, literally yeah. so self-focused in that. But the idea was like, just get a community. It was literally selfish focused. I just wanted to have people come down that I was like, hey, if they're trying breathwork and meditation, they're connecting. They're the kind of people I want to be yeah. around because they're on that journey. And we had 20 people first week. And then the weekend after was supposed to be the cool to be conscious experience, which is ruin rise, um, like six hour, seven hour immersion event. Okay. And so there was supposed to be that. And I reached out to them and said, look, I'm coming to facilitate, like assist at the experience, whether you like it or not, I'm going to be there to help. And I said, I'm coming from a place of wanting to serve and, and, and help in that way. And they're like, wow, we, we really are like your vibe. That, yeah. That'd be sick. And I said, I'm also running, starting this on the, the sunny coast at the moment. You're welcome to come down. And what actually ended up happening was the boys didn't promote it um, at all. Like they were supposed to have their experience, but then with the lockdowns, they couldn't run it. So their, right. their event stopped. But because of we'd had a couple of calls that week on Zoom and they felt my passion and my conviction and my want to serve that they were like, let's go anyway. Let's go drop in on his session. And so we went from 20 people first week to 135 the second week. And the boys were just like, dude, it took us like a year to get to like 150 yeah. people. It's your second week. Like you've, there's, an, there's an energy here. And from there, after that weekend, obviously the boys and I had conversations like, look, if you've grown it this quickly in two weeks, you, you're here to serve. You know, would you want to be linked up? And at first there was – because I'd always been like the control guy. Yeah. You know, if I was a leader, I had to do everything and that was my conditioning. Like no one else can do it as good. I was, you know, massively driven by that ego part. And so the thought of collaborating and being under someone else's brand and not having the reins was a real challenge for me. But I was like, no, I know that this is the best thing to do because I need to let go of that and break free of that crappy story and enable myself to to serve a greater purpose because the boy's mission and vision is incredible. And so, yeah, we, we had a couple of calls and I was like, you know what, let's do it. Let's collaborate. Let's partner up. We'll, we'll brand all of this cool to be conscious. This is not my thing. I want to be on your mission and your vision. And it's literally just grown from there. Like we're getting around 150 to 200 mm-hmm. people every week. And the amount that have been through so far is already over like, I think 1500 to 2000. Wow. And it's crazy because, you know, I'd lived on the sunny coast for four years and I felt like I was this little fish. Now it's like wherever I go, they're like, oh, there, you're the breathwork guy. Yeah. And I'm like, because my back, like my background is in training athletes, 
physiology and now the subconscious, the identity. And so everyone's like, oh, you're the breath worker. I'm like, mm, no, I'm not. <laughs> this is what I do. But yeah, you know me from the breath work. And yeah. I actually got challenged on that recently because a guy was like, oh, you're the breath work guy. And I was like, no. And he said, well, hold on a minute. You're pushing away something that's really serving you. Why are you doing that? And I had to kind of sit with it. And I was like, shit, okay. If people know me as a breath worker, I'm like, yes, that's me. But my passion, my purpose, my mission in life is Beautiful. identity. And that was, yeah, a big shift. So now it's the, the the vision with cool to be conscious in that way. I'm rocking the shirt today, yeah. which is cool. I said to the boys, I'm like, hey, I'm going to run the shirt because no doubt it'll come up. And they're like, yeah, dude. So, um, or in their Kiwi accent, yeah. Yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whatever they do. Sorry, dude. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, cheer, Morty. Yeah, That's cheer, how they cheer oh, bro. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so, um, oh, it's <laughs> crazy. So, the the vision of it is basically as we're moving, we've got Gold Coast, Sunny Coast, we'll be having Airlie Beach, then we've got more facilitators coming on in all the major capital cities around Australia, and then the same thing in New Zealand. Mm. And what will happen is the vision is, you know, every Sunday morning at 6 a.m. or 7 a.m., depending on what time of year it is, you'll be dropping in, you'll have the same connection questions, you'll have the same breathwork tracks, you'll have the same meditation. And whether you're in Sunshine Coast or you're in Florida in the U.S. or in somewhere in Europe or New Zealand, you're having the exact same experience. And that way you can talk and, hey, what came up in this question for you? And, you know, people all around the world and, the movement's grown so quickly. Like they had maybe like 5,000 people on Instagram like a few months ago. Now they got like nearly 20K wow. and it's just going nuts all around the world. And um, it's just that the energy that the boys bring. And I guess in that, like I've absorbed a lot of that and, and stepping forth in myself in that way. It's just showing up as a conscious present man, but speaking from a place of truth and conviction. And it's, I guess it's just really radiating and people are like drawn to it, yeah. which is really cool because now – I've just been down on the Goldie for four days, networking and, and having a bunch of epic meetings. And I'm leaving and they're like, oh, you know how I was a while ago. Like, I want to move to the Goldie. But then this time I was driving home and I was literally like singing and dancing the whole way yeah. home, like bopping away because now I was excited because I was going to catch up with my family on the sunny coast last night for dinner and then have a private breath work event this morning. So it's like now I, there's this community, this tribe, this family on the sunny coast that I can actually, I'm like, I'm a part of this. Awesome. And yeah, so that's, that's huge. Mate, obviously so much to take out. The first thing that I've just got to commend you regarding is like you you did something about your situation and it wasn't a like I'm just going to up and leave and try and chase someone else's dream or environment or friendship circle. And, and even right now as you explain all this, I'm like, oh man, maybe I can be a cool to be conscious. Still say, you know, like yeah. I want to I dive into your dream, your reality, you know, because yeah. I, I see like I see so much value and, and benefit from it. But like that wasn't an option for you when you created this for yourself, which is bloody beautiful. Yeah. And um, like how oh, I've got, got tons of questions, but let's talk about the event. Like firstly, so I was lucky enough to, I think I went to your third stillness and yeah. it was probably, yeah, just on 200 people there or, or just shy of it. And it was obviously a little bit intimidating. You're going and you're walking up to a group of people that are sitting on towels that you've never met before. And then, um, then there's Toddy and a, a couple of uh, other facilitators standing up the front and some music's playing. And then they tell you to go talk to someone um, that you haven't met before. And that's obviously thrilling. And we all love doing that. <laughs> oh, we all yeah. love sitting down and talking to people we don't know. And But no, no, but I, I did feel connected to that young gent. Like he, I, I forget his name, unfortunately, but he worked at Woolworths. He had, had a partner. He was excited for the next steps of his life. He was grateful for, for a few different things. And it was cool for me to talk about why I was there and that I got, I get to speak to you soon and a lot of other things. And then the breath work, like, yeah, there's obviously something to breath work, you know, like there's a reason why everyone knows or most people know who Wim Hof is. And, yes. uh, I I just I don't know if again you make this up or if if whatnot, but I I remember different colors like different shades of blue and pink and and green rolling over my my vision. Obviously, my eyes are closed, but it started off coral, like when you, you're looking in the sun, it's like bright. But then yeah, blue would roll over that, and then green, like that was interesting and yeah. felt very light headed. But yeah. um, waking up felt just like all of my stresses or worries just didn't, it didn't matter, yeah. which was really nice. 
And then we did this big cultish circle. Yeah, I remember like, you said that at the end. You're like, that circle at the end was a bit culty. And I was like, yeah, I get it. I get it. Like, if you're walking along the beach, you see, like, 200 people. Cold hands. Like, holding hands in a massive, like, Mexican way. You're like, a little what bit the cult. fuck's going on here? But it's sick because most weeks you have people walking past and they're like, hey, can we join in? Like, they oh, really? like, just pop up on the side and, like, tap someone on the shoulder. And so, like, yeah. we make a big thing out of that. Like, yeah. Yeah, and come so, in. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's sick. Yeah, and look, it felt, like felt good, man. Like I was happy to be a part of the cult. <laughs> yeah. I was, uh, I'm in, man. I'm in that. Yeah, well, I'm pretty sure that with like culture comes yeah, from the root yeah. word in cult, and obviously nowadays we have a really strong stereotype and conditioning around the word cult because we think of you know the Kool Aid thing and all yeah. of that, and like you know having the 15 wives or whatever it is, yeah. but. Um, is it wild, wild, wild country or that that uh, documentary on Netflix about that Indian bloke who moved to America and bought all this land and and have you not watched? No. Is that where everyone dies on the in the yeah. shed? Yeah, yeah, that's what, a, yeah. that's where the saying like "Did you drink the Kool Aid?" comes oh, from. Oh, right, yeah, because they people make that comment about like personal development events. Oh, you went to a Tony Robbins event? Did you drink the Kool Aid? Because like they're <laughs> yeah, like, oh, it's a cult. Enough. Yeah, so. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I, I see why it can look like a cold as well. Like I think about my past self, 20 years old, right? Like I, I've figured out the world, man. Like I, <laughs> I know, man, I've got it sorted. I'm yeah. 20. I know. <laughs> I know. And I see some bloke happy yeah. and kind and yeah. caring and loving. Like what a wanker. Yeah. <laughs> like, what, like, yeah, like, and then like and there's in a group of people, like they're all crazy. Yeah. It, it's all of that internal ego projection. Yeah, just coming out. That's all yeah. it is. Hey, yeah. I literally yeah. had this conversation yesterday afternoon with a, one of the guys down on the Goldie. I hadn't seen for a bunch of years. Shout out to, to Joe, Joe Stevens. And he said like when I'd, because I'd been in the athlete performance space and I'm really grateful and fortunate that I was at a really high level with that. That's kind of my, where I first started on social media was like motocross, mm. commentary, sports journalism, racing. And then I was in team management. And then I was moving into like the training side of things. So my kind of social view changed. And then I went into like the holistic health approach as I was learning so much about that. And then as I moved more into the subconscious, he said that, he used to see my stuff when I was talking about mindset and the subconscious and he'd be like, fuck that. Like it just trigger him and yeah. like scroll past, like screw that guy. Wasting I don't need time. to fucking change. Yeah. yeah. Like that. And then as he's sort of done more work, he's like, Oh, that was my projection. Like that wasn't you that any, and this is something that's any negativity that is projected from oneself to another is an internal issue or challenge or insecurity. So if you're personally going out of your way to make someone feel bad or say something negative to them, that's coming from a place of something lacking in, in yourself. 100%. And that's where I guess now like my life is an embodiment of only speaking positively of people. And if people, like if there's someone I don't get along with or align with, I won't say they're a shit person or no, I don't agree with their stuff. It's like they're doing their best. It's just not in alignment with me because I know that that's the case. We are all doing our best. And that's how I was like, obviously with what I've gone through now to be where I am, I'm like, there was parts of me that hated my old self because when you have two near death experiences by it, 25 you're like what the hell are you doing and there was a lot of guilt and anger towards my old self and now it's like appreciation acceptance i was doing the best i could yeah and so, you wouldn't be where you are now without it eh? yeah exactly yeah. man like uh, like i know i still struggle with that and a lot of us struggle with that you know like is is being um well like understanding or being empathetic to everyone else's situation it's obviously a lot harder when you're emotionally tied to a situation or person and yeah. And that takes a lot of work internally, whether it's uh, self development, work, even just goal setting, working towards goals. Just life, life lessons, right? They either come and you can focus on them indirectly or directly. Yeah. And like, so you mentioned, obviously, some of the health troubles that you've had, and yeah. obviously, your brain doesn't pop up in every brain. And I, I don't know how you speak about yourself, but it's I find it's quite rare to. Sp- to speak to someone with such conviction and I'm lucky I've been trying to like pile them up, which is really cool. But yes. um, like how, how do you, yeah. How, how are you the way you are? Tell us about your journey and, and like, where's it the first really big step would be really interesting to start with if you're happy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, where to start specifically would be like where this, this journey I'm very clear on started was I was labeled as gifted as a child in primary school. So like I was really intelligent so I got skipped ahead a year. Okay. But what happened then was like in a nutshell form, 
I didn't belong with anyone because you're not in your old year group. You're now this new kid in the year, new year group, and like, you don't belong here. And when you're an out, I was from a town that's second flattest place on earth, 2,000 people, like country town. Yeah. If you don't play rugby, you don't exist. And sure. I was a motocross kid, and I was yeah. chubby and a nerd. So, like, <laughs> put those. Yeah, you're going to do sweet. Like, I was just, like, the the target for all of the yeah. shit throwing you could imagine. And, and it basically got to a point where I was at, like, at age 10, I was speaking suicidally to mum and – uh, I didn't want to go to school anymore and everything. And basically what happened was from that, that whole experience, I made a story that I was, you know, well, I didn't really made a, make a story in that way. I was different in, in, in that way of I couldn't fit in. Couldn't fit in with the year above me. Couldn't fit in with the, the year that, you know, that I went into. Couldn't fit in with my old year because I was this in-between kind of guy. And uh, that was like the ultimate alienation and it got, you know, the, the bullying was so severe that I was like, if you, I got to a point and this is the, the epic part of the ego is it will protect us. Mm. And so my ego was like, if you're going to fucking bully me for being different, oh, and it was like, I'll be fucking different. Oh, right. I'll be so different. Yeah. You're not going to want to bully me because it's a waste of your fucking time. Yeah. Like there was this, I was 10 and I started, I guess my, maybe my conviction started there was like, I had such a need to, I was in so much pain but I guess whenever I felt pain in my life, I've like lent into it. Like, what can I take from this? And that I don't necessarily think I was born with it. I remember like in year two, I was like, I can still clearly remember the day that I was walking from one classroom to another. And I was like, I'm going to do big things in the world. Yeah. I didn't know what it was, yeah. but I just had this like inner knowing almost like my spirit or my soul was like, you're going to do big things. And, and then, so this story was, I'm going to be really fucking different. And that way, if you pick on me for being different, I've brought that on. So it's like, bring it yeah. on. Like I'm, I'm waving the identity, flag. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And then, and then what it ended up happening was as I got to, like, I went away to boarding school and then around the age of 14, 15, I, I hit puberty. I was a late bloomer and I'd already been, my life was already becoming about being different. I'd started sports commentary when I was 13. So I was the guy on the mic, like yeah, commentating yeah. sporting events. And I was like, come on, let's go. I go, pit screen, no, like, I hadn't hit puberty or anything. Oh, dude, I watch back the videos now. I'm like, uh, good thing you can practice and improve skills. Yeah. And um, and I was at boarding school and basically I hit puberty and I got some abs and then I got some attention from some girls. Mm. And that's when I was like, hmm, okay. I had a little bit of confidence to kind of stand up for myself, whereas before that I just run and hide. Yeah. And I've never been in a physical fight, couldn't find my way out of a wet paper bag. Like, fuck, terrible. Like, it, please don't ever fight me, anyone <laughs> listening to this, because I'll get smoked. <laughs> I'll just hug you to death. Well, you are a guy that rubs people the wrong way, obviously. So I'm surprised you haven't been in a fight. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it was like when I was when I was 15 was when my personal development journey started. So that's like 11 years ago now, which I started to like, I guess for me, I was doing things different and I was having success at a young age at school and the commentary and things like that and was being noticed and, and people like, oh, you know, you're doing so well for so young and what I started to do was look into like, what are the best in the world do? And it was like, to me, I started this story of different is protection because at first that's what it was, was I'm going to be different to protect me. Then it became the best in the world are the 1%. That's different to the 99. Oh, different equals success. So it's gone from different equals protection to this next layer of different equals success. So then I was like ingrained in my brain. When everyone else goes left, you go right. Because that's what the majority do. That's what the sheep do. That's what the crowd does. That's where you'll end up being like everyone else. Fuck that. Go this way. So when the kids were like getting the Raven shoes in school, I'd tell them how stupid they were. And when they wanted to go out and drink, I'd say it was a waste of time. And I'd pretty much just try to refute everything. So everyone hated me. Yeah. But I was like bringing it on. Like oh, that's yeah. kind of what I wanted because I, like, I don't want to be with the crew. And now I know that was from a massive place of lack and pain. It wasn't from a place of confidence. It was like, I need to do this because I don't do well in the crowd because I'm the, I don't have the skills or the talent or the looks yeah. or whatever. And that continued on. And, and basically like I continued with the sports commentary as I was racing motocross and then had a pretty sketchy accident when I was like 15 turning 16, lacerated my kidney and Ooh. nearly bled out. So that was Jesus. pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, I was, I've broken like every limb in my body a number of times at motocross background. Like, so I've been in and out of hospital a lot, but when, uh, when I finished high school, I went to uni and studied, started studying sports science, um, and started training athletes down in Vic and that kind of started progressing. And, and I was at 18, I started 
mm, commentating the national motocross series because I'd raced it yeah. at the national level, but then they wanted me to mm. lean into that. So when I did that, I took over managing a national motorsport team, like the, the junior, the Kawasaki, the motocross Jeez. motorcycle brand, managing their junior team. And like some of the kids were only like 17 months younger than me, but I was managing, you know, the sponsors, the the international, like the junior world Jesus. championships, trips and everything. And and so there was another part of that was, again, this story of like, oh, you're so young, you're so, so doing so well. And I was like, yeah, I am because I'm different. And that led further into like as I was going through uni, um, interning down at Woodford Sports Science Consulting in Melbourne. So that's a for, for Christian Woodford. He'll listen back to this. I'm like, yeah, I've got a plug. <laughs> um, and that's, that's a big part of where I got my passion and like whatever you stand for, you fucking go after that because that's how he lived his life. He is the most – the most passionate man I've ever met in my entire life. And for that, a lot of people hate him because he says exactly what he feels and he speaks it from a place of conviction. But that's been kind of bred into me. And so I was down there and he basically told me this is towards the end of my degree. At this point, I'd started in sports journalism in motocross and, and whatnot as well and was training a lot of the athletes. And he said, if you want to be successful in this, you want to be the best in the world because that's how I – how I was, I was like, oh, I'm going to be the best. I'm different. And he said, you need to go to America and you need to go to a college and work in their facilities. And so I was also like a plan A guy. I'm going after it. And so I was enrolled in my masters of ex, ex phys, exercise physiology. But I was like, to me, that was like an easy way out, like an insurance policy. Oh yeah, I can do the NDIS thing. Oh yeah, I can work in the hospital sector, but it's not my passion. Yeah. And at that point, my passion was training athletes. So I was like, no, I exited my masters to come and, um, just intern for two weeks on the sunny coast to get a letter of recommendation to get a foot in the door at Stanford university Jeez. in, in the U S and I went up there and the guys that, that were there that I needed to, you know, intern under were like, wow, you know, your shit at a young age. Do you want to come up and teach at the uni and run out, you know, teach our PT courses and coach your clients and consult with athletes. And it's like, absolutely. Cause down in Vic, I was already, I was 20 and I was managing the athlete Academy in central Victoria. Um, so I wasn't really learning. I was teaching all the other coaches yeah. and and I was still at uni and we had other uni students coming to do placement under me. So it was like this, I was, I didn't feel like I was growing and, and I always want to kind of be like the student in the room in that way. So I came up here and, and then that's kind of what led to, you know, my, I got to after around 12 months of, of doing the work up on the sunny coast, I got to head to Stanford and got to coach in their Olympic sport program with multiple, like Katie Ledecky is one of like the most yeah. decorated Olympians of all time in their NFL programs and, and got to, to be in that environment um, and go through all of the different aspects and faculties and did a bunch more with some other um, facilities and, and things over in New York and Boston and San Diego. And by, by that time, I'd actually gotten to a point where I'd been training athletes, you know, for a number of years and was realizing – in, especially in motocross and the action sports, we had the best scientifically wise, data wise metrics. We had the best programs in the country, arguably the world. Mm. The numbers we were producing with our athletes were so incredible, but they weren't winning. Like they were like a fifth to 10th place guy. And you know, when you're obsessed and you're doing everything you can and things aren't adding up, I started to go, there's something missing, something missing. And then it clicked one day with one of my athletes. I realized it was where he was with his subconscious and that's where my journey started going deeper yeah. into analyzing it because I'd been to plenty of personal development events um, in the years prior for my own growth. But that's when I started to looking at it as like studying to bring forth for my athletes and that continued and developed and um, ended up launching TJT, which was my business um, basically from just natural demand. Like when I was teaching at uni, I was really passionate and that's, I can still remember Steel because Steel was the big friendly giant. And I'm like this little guy, like, <laughs> come on, let's do this. And that, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> and, um, and from that, TJT was born, which was back then, it was like, my athletes called me TJ. And yeah, then they okay. joke, like, I'm TJ trained. Oh, so right. that's where nice. TJT came from. TJT. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so that started. And I had no fucking idea about business. Like at start, I was teaching at uni, training athletes. Like I was getting paid by the uni. I was getting paid by my athletes directly. Had no idea about business systems. And then I kind of get thrown into this. Okay, now people want me as their mentor. How do I do this as a business system? I had no idea. And TJT just continued to grow. And we ended up having multiple events and seminars and, and mentorships and our advanced grad programs, which was amazing. Yeah. But because I didn't know how to manage the business side of things and what I realized now was I wasn't living my true path, mm. I was 
I wasn't passionate about sports science at that point. I was doing it because, quote, unquote, I was knowledgeable, you know, and I'd sunk costs. Like, you know, when you've invested so much, it's really hard to let it go. It's the path of least resistance. Yes. And I wasn't listening to my body. Like by that 2016, I was first hospitalized for a couple of weeks. Um, and the, the medical term is ulcerative colitis, where the immune system attacks your, your colon, your large intestine. And it's just an autoimmune condition like many others, rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, you know, type 1 diabetes, all of those. And, and they put me on some medication and whatnot in 2016. I was cleared up after a few months and then went back to living my life as I was. And then end of 2018, I was teaching at the uni, running the mentorship program, training athletes in the gym and consulting online while trying to train and manage a relationship. I was sleeping like I'd go to bed at like 2 a.m., wake up at like 4.30. I was getting like two and a half, three, three and a half, four hours sleep a night. And I wouldn't rest in between. Like I wouldn't sit down to eat. I'd always be going. And basically what happened was what I now know was I was just running my body into the ground. And I ended up, you know, back in hospital largely through most of 2018, uh, 2019, uh, in and out. But the thing was, because of my where I was, and this is where so much of my shift has been, I had the ultimate mindset because of my different story. I'm the fucking guy. Like if I'm shit waking up in the morning and I'm shitting blood all through the toilet, go harder. Go go run harder into the pavement. Go lift more weight. Like that was my mentality. Which now I look back, I'm like, you fucking idiot. <laughs> but that's where I was. I was yeah. like, you know, because I you'd listen to the in the motivational videos and all of that, mm. and you feel good and like David Goggins. I oh, do. Yeah, are you yeah. Are, those yeah. those are the kind he's of your, like, he's yeah. all right. Yeah. Like the, the spirit animal yeah, back yeah, in that's the day. Right, that's yes. Right. Yeah. And like Jocko Willink and, and yeah. being to so many personal development seminars where it was all about motivation and mindset and achieving the goals. And that's where my whole life was. And, and I was in like a state of denial of how bad my health was getting. And it turns out I was like stage three pancolitis for like 12 months, which is like oh, for shit. that, that's the equivalent of like anyone else would be there. They're in hospital within like three days. I was living like that for like 12 months, just shitting blood constantly mucus. And I was like, no, no, I'll get better. I'll push harder and I'll get better. And, I ended up getting to a point where in July 2019, I was hospitalized again, like an emergency hospitalization. I wasn't able to kind of like move or hold myself or anything. And that's when I was like, I need to stop. Like I'm, I'm trying to manage and I'm, I don't use the word try anymore because try is really weak in terms of our body's energy. Um, but I, at that point, I was actually trying to manage the business and failing because of the business systems that were needed and I didn't know how to do it while managing my health. So my health was going down because of the stress and the business was still doing well, but the amount of time I was needing to invest was burning me out. And so, yeah, July, 2019, I stopped. And that's when I kind of like put a pause on the business. And then I thought I'm going to take some time to rest. So I went and had some time in isolation in Port Douglas and just went on the road for a bit. And then, yeah, September, 2019 was when I was hospitalized again in an emergency situation. And this time was when the 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 doctor I've spoken about this on a few other potties and whatnot and I now know that I wasn't going to die like the, the hospital would have been able to save my okay. life but they came in and they were like you are at this point you have 24 to 48 hours to live if things don't go well and I'm like a 25 year old guy laying in a hospital bed my mum's on speakerphone she hears that she's fucking distraught like she was screaming and crying on the phone my family friend because I have no family up here my family friend was standing there bawling her eyes out like what the fuck? And that's that moment. I obviously, I, in the days to come afterwards, I had to see a psychiatrist and everything. Cause I was like, just kill me. Like I, cause what they were saying is the option was, you know, the colostomy bag. That, yeah, that, yeah. They said, that's you. And I said, no, like my life is about health and performance. Oh, that okay. is the ultimate failure. And because my identity was so wrapped up in it, I was in denial. I was like, not a chance. No way. That, that is a 9.9. Death is a 10. I was like, I'd rather be dead than live with that thing. And that, that's where I was at at that point. And so I was like, is there a way that you could, you know, if this wasn't going well, that you could, you know, kill me? I'd rather kill myself. And that's when they, they, I didn't ask. They actually called in the psychiatrist and they're like, you need to talk. And what I realized was, yeah, I was in a state of denial. I'd been in a state of denial for two years, but I hadn't faced it. And it was in that time where they'd given me the 24 to 48 hours and you start to contemplate. Like, I may never see my family again they're worried about if they're ever going to see me again. Am I going to make it through? What have I done with my life? Like I've worked so hard to achieve these things. And I'd com- I didn't see my family or my friends or anything like that from the age of like 18. Once I started uni, I didn't make time. Like we'd have family holidays. I'd skip them to go and work or study or learn. And, and I was like, 
that's when it was like kind of like my first, I guess, awakening in a way of like, what the fuck have you done? Mm. Like you've had all of this quote unquote material success that people are like, oh, congratulations, you're doing epic. Yeah. You're going to die at 25. That's where I was at. I'm like, if I'm going to die. What have I done? And it was like, I realized I had no fulfillment in myself. I was so empty and I'd done it all from a place of lack. And my mom and my dad and my one of my elder sisters, I have two older sisters, I'm the baby of the family. They flew up to see me. My elder sister couldn't fly up because her little boy Jack had an ear infection, so they couldn't fly him. And back then, I like, I was in a point where I didn't know if I was going to live. And my elder sister Chloe not making it up was like my, you know, if you've ever listening has um, heard or recent listened to the or read the book Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. If you have a strong enough why, you can overcome any how. Her not being there was like my why. I need to live because I've seen mum and dad and Amber, but I haven't been able to see Chloe. I've got to get through this. I've got to live through this. And it was a very scary time for the whole family. And what ended up happening was they put me on heavy, heavy medication. Like I was on side. Like if I went into the hospital, I had to have like the skull thing, like the triangle skull to say I'm on cytotoxic radio, whatever it is, radiative (laughs) uh, medication. And I was on infusions every couple of weeks and having to go into the hospital. And um, what I'd done was at that point in time, I realized there was something lacking internally no matter what I did externally, I wasn't, my body was still no good. And that's when I started leaning into the meditation. So the Vipassana courses, which are the 10 day silent retreats where you basically, you live as a monk, you just don't shave your head and wear the robe. And so I went into my first one of those about a week after getting out of hospital. And that's when I was like, you go pretty deep in those. And because I'd already had an experience of like, I've, I've, I've now faced death. When you've had that stripped away from you, your perspective changes. And so going into these courses, I was able to really surrender into the depth of it and I had some very profound experiences and that's when I was like, this is what I need to do. And so over the next couple of months, I basically went, I had um, split up with my partner at that point in time, just before I'd gone into hospital around then. And I basically just said, look, I'm going to leave the house. I'm just going to be on the road. So I'd literally go and sit a meditation course and I just travel in my van, just meditate, read and started going inward. And then I had a checkup in March, 2020, and the surgeons had called and they said, look, we regret to inform you, but the medication that you're on isn't working. You're what we call a non-responder. And I'd read like Joe Dispenza's work and Bruce Lipton's work. And like I said, I was a nerd. I still am a nerd. I love it. <laughs> love learning. I'd read their work for like three or four years before. So I conceptually knew all of this, how we have the capacity to heal our body but I hadn't embodied it because I was so scared from the fear that had been instilled from me by the white lab coat saying nothing else will save you. You need the medication for the rest of your life. Otherwise you're not going to get through. And so that's that deep level seated from the emotional place belief. And when they called me and said, look, you know, the medication isn't working. I was like, well, what, what do we do? They said, well, what we're going to try to do is give you some more and kind of change the routines. And basically it's like, it's like a cocktail. They're just adding in more and more and trying to, and it was at that point where that that day was probably like the most pain I'd been in my body in the years before. It was almost like my last hope was shattered. It was like the way I explain it was like, imagine, you know, in Titanic, he's like chained to the ship. The ship starts sinking. He can't get off. That's what I felt like. I was like, the medication's failing. I'm fucked. Mm. And so three days later was the 28th of March, 2020. And I made the decision. I'm not taking medication anymore. If I'm supposed to live through this, I will live through this. And I stopped the medication on that day. And it was the scariest decision I've ever made because all I had was fear and worry and concern. But I'd come to a point of like, I feel like, I remember how I said about like year two, I remembered I felt like I was here for a higher purpose. I was like, I know that if this, this feeling is correct, I will trust this and I will make it through. And the next two weeks, I had no guide, no, no one around me. Again, I was up here by myself. I had my housemate at the time. And she actually had to take time off work to care for me. I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't move. I couldn't sit up. I was in such agonizing pain. I lost like 20 kilos in a couple of weeks um, because I couldn't, I couldn't, not only I couldn't eat food because if I swallowed like this, imagine it's like your whole arm is just covered in blood, like 
you've got you've run you're down the, running down the bitumen at 50k an hour on a cycle yeah. or whatever and then it just Comes takes up. everything off it's like that's like someone coming up and like putting hot tabasco sauce on you or whatever it's mm. just like that and so i couldn't consume anything but also because my body was in such a bad way it was in a catabolic state which is breaking down just muscle was just eating itself off me and and those those two weeks now i know the first time around i wouldn't have died hospital would have saved me second time around i wasn't going to the hospital so they brought a doctor like to, to come and see me and i didn't know till later on this is months down the track six months down the track dad actually told me the doctor was like i'm concerned for me being here because if he dies it's on me mm-hmm. and that that there was a two-week period where dad hadn't actually because dad needed to come care for me at that point yep. there was a two-week period where i was by myself and every single day all i could do was lay in bed and my body was at a point where it had shut down so much i couldn't even feel emotion we were talking about comedians before I was like watching stand up comedy, like my favorite comedians, to like Bill Burr and Kevin Hart, and what's that English guy name? Anyway. Uh, not Jack Whitehall, Ricky Gervais. Ricky Gervais. Uh, Ricky Gervais is one of them, but there's another guy, and he he's got the he does the inhale up. <laughs> oh, Jimmy Carr. Jimmy Carr. Yeah, yeah. and I would love, I would love yeah, the, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Shout out to Rue, the boy from Cool yeah. to Be Conscious. He has the same laugh. Oh, does he? The inhale yeah. up. I love it. Anyway, uh, R.I.P. Sean Locke. Hey, yeah. uh, that eight out of ten cats does count down. You ever watch that? No. Uh, that, okay. Like, Can so I write that down. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely write it down. I'll write it down for you. Um, there's like a show called Countdown. So we're digressing, and I apologize. Yeah. But a show called Count Countdown where um they like pull out some numbers, and a couple of people have to uh, quickly use the numbers to add up to a total number. Yeah. And they also pull out some letters, and they got to make the longest word out of the letters. Okay, it's like an ABC show. Yeah. So eight out of ten cats. Does count down as like two comedians, uh, Sean Locke and John, someone, Jimmy Carr's the host. Yeah. And they play that game okay. with comedians. I want to watch this because I yeah. got a sense of humor now. Yeah. <laughs> You've got it back? <laughs> that, got that, back. Yeah, that was gone. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, so that's w- wild. So like all this time in bed, yeah. can't feel emotion. You're well, trying to- yeah, I was like, I was literally, because laughter is good for the immune system. Mm. I was watching these two laugh, you know, because at this point I wasn't on any medication. I was like, how the fuck am I going to heal myself? And I was like, I'm just going to try to feel good. That's all I could do yeah. at that point. And so I was watching this. I literally couldn't get a laugh out of me. And my, you know, my partner at the time was like, there was no affection, no love, no fit. There was no capacity to feel. And now I know it was because my body was literally in survival mode. Cause it's like any excess energy that was used for creating an emotional feeling, something was right. gone. The body was that, that far down. And yeah, those two weeks, every night I went to bed for those two weeks, I was writing a letter home to my family to mum, what I love about you, what I'm so grateful you taught me, my dad, my sisters, my brother-in-laws, my nieces and nephews. Like it was, it was fucked up now that I look back because when you have like, you hear people having these experiences of like contemplating and and being in that state of knocking on death's door, it's usually like like a big accident or something like that where it happens to one day. But for me, it's like I was laying by myself for two weeks and that's all I could contemplate for that time. And, and, uh, that was when my whole that that experience was when everything shifted in my life because that was when I really knew it tore everything away from me and because I had to sit, sit it's kind of like monks Buddhist monks meditate on death they go to the cemetery and watch bodies get burnt to realize the truth of life and for me that was like my experience of that was I had to live that and then Mitchell Vicarage actually reached out to me in like a synchronistic way it's like hey dude you're not doing well do you, you need help. And we got on a call and he's actually the guy that saved my life. He's a, he's a, he's the guy that introduced me to deep breath work. Yeah. Cause I'd been on the, you know, the whim journey, uncle whim been on that sporadically for years and, you know, maybe five or so years before. And, and then, um, Mitch introduced me to holotropic breath work and, and he has brought me, he taught me what I now know about how to heal the body. Because at that point in time, we were working at like the gut microbiome level and, and fecal microbial transplant and all of those things, which is leading edge edge tech and, and um, medical procedures. But now I know, in hindsight, we were so far off the mark and most of the medical system still is in and around the gut because they're doing all of this work at the gut, but it keeps returning to its base. Mm. By default, and in terms like sort of scientific terms, you go to the root cause, it's not the root cause. Because if we're fixing it and it returns, something else is off. And what he brought my awareness to was the fact that it was my liver and my kidneys that were way off. And it was causing all of this excess stress in my digestive system. So all we did for the first like four or five months of my 
I got moved down to Victoria so that I could be cared for by my mum. Yeah. Like I couldn't, still couldn't get out of bed or anything. And and um, and all we did was work on the liver and the kidneys, and that started to get me vitality and energy back when my body could actually start to kind of like function. And and when you say work on these organs, do you mean through breath work? Uh, through breath work, through nutraceuticals, so like herbal tinctures, okay. um, through a particular supplements and things of that nature, through a lot of emotional release work, because now understanding with breath work and, and trauma and all disease at the root level is caused by stress, excess stress, which is inflammation, and that inflammation is linked in with genetic, I shouldn't say genetic, cellular mutation, which is where we then get what we have, whether it's joint pain or a cancerous growth or that's all cellular mutation that's caused at the root of it by stress. Wow. And so it's kind of like um, David Hawkins is a kinesiologist with the, the map of consciousness. And basically anything below 200 hertz, you can, you know, for those that are listening, it'd be worth Googling this and having a look. Our, our emotions are on a scale from zero to 1,000 and anything under 200 is disease causing. Obviously the lower it is, the worse it is for, for causing disease, you know, the, the closer to 200, the less impactful it is and, and intense. And so through breath work, what breath work actually does, and you know how you're talking earlier about like that state of kind of like peace and, and whatnot, what it does is it shuts down the, the frontal lobe of the brain. I should say decreases the blood flow and kind of quietens it, which is a, the prefrontal cortex, which is our thinking analytical brain. It shuts that down. And as a result, what can happen is, you know, imagine you've had an experience where you've just nearly had a car crash or whatever, and you're like, holy shit, I'm so shaken. But then you got to walk into a job interview. You're kind of like, I'm all good. I'm all good. And you, what you do is you suppress it. You push it down. And that's a low energy because it's a worry or a fear. Right. And that's, let's say, fear is, I believe, 75 hertz. So the low, death is zero, dead, no, no living. Gr- uh, shame is 20 hertz. Guilt is 30. And then we go like fear is 75 and so on. They kind of build up. And so breath work enables that part of the brain that, is the part that gets us, tells us to hold everything down and don't let it up to clear that. The analogy I give, and I've only been speaking to this people about this privately, so this is the first time it's actually been publicly sort of expressed. Phew. Lucky you guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 yeah, so yeah. so uh, trauma, disease, anything like that is caused by this low frequency because obviously we're, we're all energetic beings at that. Yeah. You know, If you use an electron microscope, we know that within the cell we have the, the molecule, within that we, you know, we have the the atom and then we have the subatomic particles and just really quickly when you refer to like the hertz and, and david hawkins work you're referring to the frequency in which we're running yes and when we're running at a lower frequency we tend to be feeling these feelings or we are feeling these feelings of fear of shame of guilt of yes yeah, we, we literally are that frequency mm. and there can be different parts of our body that are different states so like right. this is kind of where we get and, into energy centers and yeah whatnot. and yeah. i guess that like ties into a lot of joe Dispenza's work right where he talks yes. about the energy that you put off and yes. talks about your energy field and that yeah. like you can almost feel the other like other people's energy fields when you tune into this part of life which and this is another area which like a 20 year old me can be like what the fuck are you talking about yeah. bro yeah so what shit? Uh, yeah. i can't see it so it's not t- yeah. yeah 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 so I'd, like i'd love sorry i cut you off but i just wanted to make sure i was on sort of the same path yeah, yeah. and so that yeah the frequency is obviously for the the non-scientific background frequency is just the number of wavelengths per second right so high frequency move means there's really quick vibration a lot going on so like enlightenment in that way is you know a thousand love is like 528 hertz death is zero you know shame is 20 so that gives you an idea of it's the higher the frequency the higher the vibration then the the better it is in that way and we can have different parts of our body that hold different that store you could say store different frequencies so you know that's kind of where we get into like the chakras and i used to be so close to that scientific mind again like teaching at uni physiology all of that and then you have a when you have a near-death experience and you go through and realize all of these things you're like okay there's a whole lot of stuff that science can't show and prove and i've felt i've lived that now i know i can't be unseen yeah like once you see color you can't unsee it so that what the breath work does is Imagine you have a, an, an event in your, in your life where, let's say it's traumatic. For example, if we just used um, a car crash, okay? So you have the, the visual memory of it, like, you know, someone pulls up, you're doing 80Ks, bang, you smash into them, okay? There's that visual memory, but then there's also the emotion that comes with it. And the emotion is 
fear, like um, pain, those kinds of things, yeah. apprehension, whatnot, they kind of get tied together in a little ring box, you know, like an engagement ring box that pops open. They kind of like get popped in there, closed up by the you know the conscious part of the mind. Sure. And then basically it's when we, we don't get them out, we it, this ring box gets stored within us, that energy. And because it's a low frequency energy, it's it's kind of lowering us. Mm-hmm. And that's where, you know, we have that disease causing state if we have enough of it. And what what happens is we keep those down and the more of these experiences we have that keep down, the more our average energy basically keeps lowering and lowering. And those people are the ones that have, you know, disease causing issues and all of that. And and what the breath work enables is for all of those ring boxes basically that are down. If you went, you know, it's like seeing if you go to see a psychologist or a psychiatrist, they want you to lay down and talk about it, which there is a time and place and a service in that. But what happens is a lot of people, as it starts to come up, that little ring box goes to open and there's this little, like, it's like the light comes out of, oh, fuck, there was, you know, for the car crash, there was fear and and, and worry. And there's that mental image, oh, close that, put it back down. Don't want to feel that. Yeah. And so people aren't able to let it out. And that's where, like, PS, uh, sorry, PTSD, PTSD. Like oh. comes from right and stems from it's these yes. stored things that you've repressed yes. that are now slowly coming to the surface and like the obviously easiest way to understand PTSD is to think about someone who's served right but then you have um, victims of sexual abuse when they're kids and like uh, broken families and all of these different underlying issues that if aren't dealt with or aren't spoken about aren't uh, understood and aren't and aren't forgiven. You know what I yeah. mean? Like you, you can know it all happened, but still be angry at it. Yeah. Like you, you're, you're going to continue to have these issues, these problems. You're going to continue to uh, be, what's the word grounded or restricted yes. by those experiences. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And that's, I've, I've got had PTSD mm. because I had no control over my bowel for so long. I, at 25, I'd shit myself in public more times than I can count. And as a 25-year-old man, that is fucking demoralizing. Oh, fuck yeah, I'd, I'd walk out of shopping centers bawling my eyes out just in shame of myself. What the fuck are you doing? You're 25. You can't, you know. Yeah. There's so much I, of that. I, and I can only imagine you comparing yourself to this hardworking kid a year ago yes. who was just the world, like, was at his fingertips, you know. I'm like, I'm so close and now look at me. I'm a piece of shit. Literally. Like, that would have been so hard to deal with. And yeah. that – that I'm, I'm those things I'm working through now, the PTSD part of it, because now whenever I'm not in a position where I'm safe and I know where the toilet is, there's that, it's the same thing, you know, yeah, it's okay. like, I'm in that, I'm not safe because there's so much emotional trauma. I didn't get to the toilet and I shit myself. There's an emotional pain there. So now my nervous system as a protective mechanism goes, find out where the toilet is or, you know, always be on red alert. So like I have to practice calming myself, centering myself, grounding so that I can actually you know, operate in this ways. And, and I really, I never used to have that empathy for people with PTSD or the anxiety or things yeah. like that because I'd never felt it. Well, I thought I'd never had. Yeah. Now that I've lived it, it's enabled me to experience that as wow. And so the the stuck, you know, the stuck energy that occurs that we have within us, what breath work does is it quietens down the mind that, the part of the mind that holds all of that in. And if you surrender fully, it's enables it's it's able to come out and be expressed because you get into what we call somatic or visceral healing. And people have like the tremors or the shakes or the movements or the crying or the screaming or the shouting or the laughter or the happiness, whatever it is. It's all of this energy that's been stuck that gets let out. They've done research in that they can have people doing one two-hour breathwork session, which is more effective in trauma release than two years of weekly psychiatry. Two hours compared to an hour weekly Jeez. for two years, which is 100 and... Just by what? turning that frontal lobe off, eh? And allowing the, the Just- innate healing capacity of the body to come through. And that's what was so big for me because I realized, and this is where we store energy in different parts of the body, shame and guilt are around the the hip to the stomach that was my thing and they're linked to anger and i had a lot of suppressed anger because of the stress and pressure i had on myself to achieve from a place of lack and so the breath work was allowing me to clear a lot of that like i had some like the only way i could explain it to begin with was like and i say this with gratitude and grace from a place of beauty they're like demonic exorcisms literally mum was scared shitless of breath work 
because I'd been doing it and I was having these, like getting all of this anger and pain out of me that had been built up. And obviously as you clear it, it gets more beautiful, more profound and incredible into what it is now. But I needed to clear all of that out because I was so unwell. And I'm, I'm epically grateful now to say that mum's actually had her first breath work a couple of weeks ago and it was the most transformative thing she's ever done. And like she was so against it for ages because of what she'd seen I needed to go through. But I said I had to, to heal myself, to be where I am now. And so, yeah, the, the breath work enables that to come up and come out and every time we let that out like let's say our average like let's say when we're born we're born at 500 we're born as a baby and just love but then with our egoic conditioning and societal conditioning and beliefs and holding things down and the bullying and the pain and the failing this and that all of these just it's like the layers of the onion just keep like compressing like your true self and there's more and more layers of crap out on top or egoic conditioning that's limiting you and that the, all of those layers are low frequency. So your average just keeps dropping every new at layer that's added. And what the breath work enables you to do is to peel those layers back so efficiently that you're raising. And literally this is where like the last six months of my life have just come in this flowing manifestation, all of these collaborations, because I know I'm my authentic self now. And that's where Mitch brought me into the breath work space in the holotropic and, and, was going yeah deeper deeper and deeper into that i was doing like a hour and a half breathe like three times a week which now i know is a lot for (laughs) anyone let alone someone that's healing but that's the amount i energy i needed moved because i'd been so unwell and i had so much sort of suppressed within me and that's why you know i speak of i guess where we were is breath work saved my life that's why i'm so passionate about it in that way and so you are the breathwork guy. I am, I am. And, the, and the identity guy. Identity is my purpose, yeah. my mission, my vision for the planet because yep. I've developed a system that I know will change the face of personal development. I know that and that's only come from the near-death experiences and the contemplation of where I was and the, you know obviously having sat meditation courses and things like that before it gave me a, an ability to objectify and observe and see things as they are. And, and uh, where I'm at now for everyone listening is I'm – like optimally healthy, my energy's amazing, my skin's great. Contextually, his I had, skin is great, by you. the way. His <laughs> skin, if these cameras don't do it justice, holy crap, this, <laughs> his skin is great. <laughs> Thank you. I'll take yeah, that. You're welcome, bro. Um, I had no sense of smell for 25 years. Oh, you have coronavirus. I was, huh? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, you had no fucking. Yeah, so. For your whole life. So, either I was born without it or. When I was like two, I was running, or I must have been like three, running with my hands in my pockets and tripped on and smashed my nose on the A-frame of a trailer and had stitches straight through and busted it. Yep. And so when I was around 15, we went and saw ENTs and specialists and whatnot to get it all tested. And they did all of the tests and I never could smell anything. And, they, and they'd also realized I had benign tumors in my skull that were compressing the olfactory nerve. Jesus. And they basically said, you'll never smell again. And I'd accepted that, that label, that identity. Yep. Yeah, I'm the guy that can't smell. And then as I was going through this journey with Mitch and I'm like, if doctors tell me I can't fucking heal myself and I'm going to die without the medication and I'm getting better without the medication, fuck the system, fuck what they say. I am living proof that I can get to this point. I'm going to get a sense of smell. So I started practicing breath work with the intention of smell, of creating a sense of smell, doing some, um, there's a a book around this kind of thing and you can go through the, the processes to do it. And I did that with the nose within three weeks. No shit. Three weeks. I was on the toilet it was the worst way to learn to smell. I was on the toilet one morning and I like took a big inhale. And I was like, oh, what the fuck is that? And then mum was like, what's wrong? And I was like, and it dawned on me like 25 years without nothing. It's like you've been blind your whole oh, life and then someone opens your eyes and you can see. It's like, what the fuck? And I've called my mom, I can smell my shit. <laughs> and she's like, what? And she's like, come running in. Yeah. Like, Cause at this time, like, because she's of probably every- more excited than when you, than when you did your first poo, when you were two in the <laughs> toilet, she was like, Oh, I get to run into the toilet with Todd in there for the second time. And be stoked. Shit, 25 year old. <laughs> yeah. so, my boy. I'm so proud. Oh dude. And you then, so do. it's, it's gotten more and more like now I can, I can smell everything now. Wow. The other night. You must struggle when you drive past KFC. Yeah, because I eat really healthy. Yeah. Well, I used to. Now I'm pretty disciplined past it, willpower uh, and everything. But it is. Yeah, I'm on. A, I'm on day six of 
day five right nice. now of a liquid fast. Yesterday I went to the Crumbin Markets with some friends. We like walked past like the donuts and like the <sighs> paella and I was like, oh, this is silly. <laughs> but but I was also with the biggest smile on my face yeah. because I was like, I can smell this. Yeah. And so now when we do breath work and, and those kinds of things, like when they, you know, sometimes they sage and things, like yeah. the biggest, biggest smile comes across my face. Beca- and this actually happened the other day. I was a beautiful breathwork facilitator took me through like a, she's a beauty therapist as well. So she kind of does like a Beck Hannon shout out to Beck. It was nuts. She took me through a, a combination of things and a part of it was a facial and she put, started putting the cream, the foam on my, on my forehead and I started smelling it and the biggest smile just came across my face and I just kept smiling for the whole facial. And then afterwards she's like, I've never seen someone smile so much in a facial. What the heck? And I was like, okay, this is why. Like, I, you know, it's this, the gratitude for being able yeah. to smell. And the same thing, like, I, I wasn't able to really walk for six months. There's an Instagram video for people that are listening. You can check it out on my page on Todd underscore Jarrett. You scroll back through. I had a video. It was like my first walk outside in like four months. And... Like now, anytime I get out of bed in the morning and walk, I have this like gratitude that, hey, my legs can pick me up today. I can, I can get out of bed and I can go and make myself breakfast because I couldn't do that for four months. Yeah. And it's just when you have all of those things stripped away, I know we talk about like you have gratitude for the little things, but it's like now I actually live that every single day. And I guess that's why I'm such a joyful person because I've had it fucking taken from me. And now I get to get it and get to have it. And I've healed myself from the inside out. I have a sense of smell when I was told I could never have that. I was told that I couldn't heal my body without the medication. And I know I've been from the science perspective through to the near-death experiences to having the spiritual experiences to go like, it's like dispensers work. Yeah. It's like Espen Helmy, Dr. Espen, same kind of thing. He's like the Aussie version of, of Joe. Joe. And that's in a way like my, I know it's a part of my journey is I was supposed to go through this and know this from the scientific standpoint to go through and realize this is possible and this is capable to share it with the world for people to know that there is hope. And if you can, you know, lean into that process and find the right people, you will be able to heal yourself because our body has the innate capacity to heal. If you cut yourself, you don't think about it needing to, you know, heal the arm. It just needs to be in a state where the body has that homeostasis to do so. But with so many of these autoimmune conditions or, or things of that nature, we're so stressed internally and eating so many inflammatory foods and, and things of that nature that our organ systems aren't functioning well, that it, the, the body can't actually rest. It's like driving your car all day and then leaving it on idle at night. You come out, it's empty of fuel. The same thing, the body doesn't have the fuel to heal for many people and they wonder why the, the supplements aren't working or why those little medications aren't helping enough and they're causing these other side effects. It's... That <laughs> he's got this big oh, just, <laughs> No, we were literally like about an hour ago. We we're having lunch, <laughs> and we were talking just about that. We um, I feel like, yeah, <laughs> it's just fun. We uh, had Greg Haglin on from uh, Switch Nutrition. He, he, yes. he got us got us a couple of uh, yes. supplements to try. Right, and, mate, his knowledge. This guy is wild. But uh-huh. anyway. Uh, he was talking about Vitality Switch and Steel actually yeah. takes Vitality too and like raved about it. And yes. So Glenn got <laughs> Glenn got a tub and like he tried it for a little while and then he was just talking about how he didn't it was a feel while. it. I reckon, yeah. I reckon it lasts me about a month or six weeks, six, yeah. eight weeks. And I was just saying like, I don't feel any fucking difference. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. but, we were, but we were literally I'm like, is it because all of you know all of these other things maybe that's why like, are you in a position good. to feel different from yeah, that like are you yeah this is the thing it's like if our body has a capacity to absorb it it will help but it's you know this is something Mitch taught me you cannot out supplement or out nutraceutical or out drug of you know whatever it is like for me my i could have taken all of the liver kidney and adrenal tinctures herbals yeah. and supplements in that but if i'm in a constant state of sympathetic overdrive and my nervous system's like this that isn't going to do shit because this hasn't actually calmed and it doesn't have the capacity. They're an adjunct, a support, a supplement, yeah. which is the word, but people try to take it as the fix. And this is the thing. It's when we get to knowing that the root cause is within the body. I, st- I take supplements now. I'm, I have nutraceuticals. I have things that are supports in that way, but I do it in a place now where um, – they work because my organs can actually do what they need to do with it. Like I can actually absorb those things. And yeah. and it's the same same case for, for many people is they take these things and they don't realize a response. If that's the case, it's usually because your body isn't at a position where it can actually absorb or take it in. The body is going too hard for that supplement to have its benefit. 
So it's it's kind of like trying to grow plants on concrete. Like you got the plants, you're watering them every day, but there's no, <laughs> no environment roots. shit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the internal yeah. environment is that massive part, and that's been really my journey in that space. And where I'm at now is yeah, like it's brought me forward to the identity system because that's what I realized I lost when I went through this whole health journey was I lost my entire identity as a human being. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. And mate, like, I guess I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you about that. Um, like I, identity, it, what, what does identity mean? I, um, when I first had this idea, I was all in a, eh? I'm like, yeah, this is it. I figured it out. I'm all in. I was just saying that uh, Tierra um, on the last podcast that like, yeah, I'm going to read four books a day. Then I don't have a job and I'm going to like fix everything in one go. And, and this is it. And, and then I found obviously that habits are hard to break, especially when you want to break 1500 habits in, in one go. And also like um after the excitement and and how like the effort to get all this going was yeah. done then then what next like there's things that i can do to contribute to this but i don't want to do them and then what am i doing with my time and also like i i wasn't uh playing footy it, like i wasn't in footy season so i wasn't hanging out with my normal normal crew so i lost my identity i felt like and then i felt yeah, like yes. i wasn't fitting in where i used to fit in and I felt like a failure because this wasn't now providing my, like my, for me financially. And then I feel like a piece of shit when I'm talking to my fiance, but like, and I know that's not the reality, but in my head it is. And then I, then yeah. that impacts how I feel about myself, my body language, what I eat, what I do. And it snowballs. Hey, and, Absolutely. and like to, to find your identity, like that must be such a blessing for you and such a best blessing for Tiara at, sorry, Tiara, who I had on previously and, like we've talked about identity quite a lot. Like what is like, what is the thing that you talk, like that you just raved on about for six hours and we've probably gone over time, but no, no, but like, what is that thing for me? What is that thing for him? Like, yeah. how do I figure that out and how do I dial it in? Yeah. And that's why I started this. Cause I want to figure it out and I want everyone else to figure it out. Yes. So this, Be- this identity mm. is the core of our human experience. And I'm going to say this from a place of passion and conviction. And if you guys at home get triggered by how hard I talk about this, nah, go nuts, because please. this will change yeah. your life if you lean into Stop it. Stop being a victim. Yeah. It's, so most people, as you just said about like changing your habits, yeah, you want to change one, but you've got 15,000 to change, whatever it is, it links your habits linked to your beliefs. But if we kind of, what I'm going to do is break it down in layers of an onion right now. And when people want to change their life, They want to change it. Like, I want to get fit. Okay, I'm going to go for a run. That's an action. So that's the outside layer of the onion. Okay, and the deeper we get, the more change it has. Okay, so outside layer is an action. I'm going to go for a run today. Sweet, awesome. Did you do it the next three days? Did you do it the next three months? No, okay, well, you're not going to get fit. Layer below that is behaviors, or we could call them habits. So things we do frequently, actions we take with frequency. And that's like, okay, I'm going to go for a run three times per week. Awesome. You've set the conscious desire to do that which is better than an action because it's a deeper layer. If you change your behavior, you by default change your action. But if your belief about yourself is I'm a fat, lazy slob or I don't like running, I don't like exercise, your belief, because it's deeper in the subconscious than the behavior or the action, it you will revert. Think of it as self-sabotage. We think we're self-sabotaging, but all we're doing is falling back to our subconscious set yep. point. So we have beliefs. Now, this is where most psychologists, most psychiatrists, most mindset coaches and life coaches and all of those things work at the level of is beliefs. Let's transform your limiting beliefs into empowering beliefs. Let's work on this belief. Let's change your belief around your fitness. Let's change your belief around men or women or whatever it is. So beliefs are an external. They can be internal and external. That you know The world is this, people are this, so on and so forth. Now, we have tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of beliefs. Really, they're limitless because it's like everything we do and see and feel and breathe, there is a belief around it. And so the personal development journey for me, you know, I'd been to all of these coaches and programs and I'd invested, in, you know, big six figures into how all of my learning over these years, I shouldn't say big six figures, over 200K into it. It's a big um, six figures. It's, 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 and you know, it's an amount, yeah? yeah it's an amount. <laughs> it's an amount. Oh, yeah, it's an amount. <laughs> <laughs> that, that all of the coaches I'd been to were at the level of beliefs. And I was like, why the fuck am I still struggling so much to overcome yeah. these things when I've done all of these belief changes? And I didn't realize this at the time. As I then went in and was doing some deeper work with like Tony Robbins at Date With Destiny and, and John Martini's work with the Breakthrough Experience and, and those guys, Bob Proctor a bit, they speak about values. So values is a layer below beliefs. So I think, let's say we've got 10, let's say just for this example, we've got 10,000 beliefs. Those 10,000 beliefs usually fit into like 100 buckets. So we kind of got like 100 beliefs per bucket. So let's say we've got the bucket of um, food, the bucket of um, 
exercise sure. bucket of supplements and then yep. all of the beliefs fall within that so they work at the level of values which which if you change a value um you're then changing the beliefs that align with it for the most part so let's say your belief is you know um i don't like running or i'm a fat lazy slob and then you change of you know your your value in that way is you don't value health okay so that falls in the health category you don't value health. None of the things above it are going to align. They'll align for a period, then you'll fall back. Why do most people yo-yo diet? Why do most people start going to the gym and not know it's, you know, they don't have the retention yeah. and they think it's an accountability issue. It's not, it's not a fucking accountability issue. It's because your deepest part of your subconscious, which I was never shown a system to and only discovered this from the near death experience is our identity. So under values is who I am, who I am creates what I do. And most people try to change their life by going, what I do do creates who I am. am. And they they try to do it that way. But that is a long, drawn-out, repetitive, energy-sapping, inefficient process of trying to go for the run every day to become the healthy person. When if you reverse engineer and you can get to the core of identity and get to that point, that changes everything. And the identity in that way is these – you know, Maxwell Waltz with his book Psycho Cybernetics was kind of like the, the grandfather of this, you know, self image. And then there's, you know, Tony speaks about it, D Martini, Bob Proctor, all of these incredible guys speak about it. The identity. The identity is the most transformative, leveraging part of the human experience. If you can change that, you'll change your life. They all speak about it, but then they they go back to coaching at the level of values. And this is because I'd been to, you know, I went to date date with Destiny end of last year after I'd had the realization of identity and there was one particular day where Tony was taking us through this, this exercise and he started talking about identity and literally my fucking heart nearly burst out of my chest. I was like, yeah, someone else is going to do it. Like someone's going to do identity. And he made the same and then went back to values. And I was like, it fucked me up mentally because my self worth, and I'm going to speak really, really uh, candidly right now. I've always felt that I could be, I'm going to do something great with the world. But when I've discovered and created the identity system that I have, which is right now like being trademarked because of the, the value of the intellectual property within it, which is the only reason it hasn't been taken public yet, is because I don't want it to get butchered by other people trying to rip it off, is that that the system, the way I've used it and healed myself and the way I've used it with my private clients at this point and the results that we've got from that are unlike anything I've ever seen. And... I know, and this is why I say I know from an internal place that this will change personal development, the whole space, because it's a layer below. And when we go to the layer below and everyone starts to take on the deepest level, then we're going to have more transformative shifts. But there was this part of me that was like, why Why have I discovered this? Why, why is it like... Yeah, the imposter so, syndrome. Yeah, dude. Like, why is Tony Robbins, why Bob Proctor, why Jay Shetty, why the... Why, like, there was that, so much of that. Why, why is it me? Maybe it's not, you know, maybe it's not yeah, that great. Maybe, maybe I'm like wrong. Maybe I'm just yes. pissing up the wrong tree. Yeah. yeah. And and so that kept coming up. And because it was a self-worth thing of like, this is going to change the fucking world. But why is it you, Todd? Why are you so special? And I really battled with that because, you know, from the outside look, listening in, people on the podcast right now, they'll be like, dude, this guy had nearly died twice at 26. He's deserving of this thing. But for me, because of the mentality, I was like, I will learn from everything. Yeah. So I hadn't really looked at it in that way. And and so over these couple of months, it kept challenging me until I kept seeing the results over and over again with my pro athletes and, and like paraplegic clients that can now ride push bikes and stuff using their legs and, and guys that are nearly retiring in sport to being second in the world within three months of implementing this. Guys that have never seen color, been colorblind their whole life, taking them through, they can see color within two yes. sessions. Like not kidding. Like this is what I mean, dispenser level stuff. Yeah. And I say that from an objective place, no ego at all, just from the results that we've seen that's like, holy crap and so that's when i was like no fuck this self-worth thing like this isn't me this is the system that is for the world so that's why i'm setting it as the identity system it's not my name it's got nothing to do with me as soon as i get it out to people and people get the result there's going to be hundreds to thousands of coaches that are going going to go how do we become and what it will be is an identity coach so then i disappear you know, and do my thing. And the identity system is what transforms the world in that way, the personal development space or whatever it is. And that's, that's why I know it's my purpose and mission in life to get this thing out to the world. Because when you change the identity, but not in a way where, you know, when you go to like, if you go to a three day event and they worked on your identity and you're like, yeah, this is who I'm going to become. This I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to embody this. I'm going to be this person. 
where they don't have the accountability, the tracking, and they don't have the set base from its focus from fulfillment. Most of these things most people do is based on external. I don't use the word goal because everything I do is about hacking and making the subconscious most efficient. Yeah. So for a lot of people, goal is like triggering to stress. Action, they think they got to go outside of themselves yeah. yeah, and do those things. So I use the word objective and I use the word embodiment because when you embody something, it's within. Yeah. And the same and kind an objective of isn't like... Like it's your objective. That's what I'm tasked to do. A goal is something you can fail. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Or I also call it like a project. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's like, so th- I'm working then, on it. Yeah. And you know how we have like, we have our goal and then we have our action steps. Yeah. What I do is what I've, you know, and this is a part of it, just making it simple. So, and again, it's all subconscious hacking because if I do this with someone and they're thinking goal and action step and they've got the identity stuff sorted, but this overwhelms them, they won't get there. So it's all about ensuring it's unfuck upable is the word <laughs> I use. Like you cannot fuck this up if you just tick the boxes and do what it says. So I set it as an instruction manual. It's a project and instruction manual. If I give you a Lego set, yeah, mm. and, and I go, here it is, follow the instruction manual. Come back to me. If, if you do all the steps, you'll get there. If you follow the steps, you will get there. But this is where personal development and mindset and psychology and all that falls short. It's like, here's a, here's a Lego. Where's the instruction manual? Oh, oh like, you know, to help we've you. Given Talk you, to me about it once a week. Yeah, we'll, we've we'll given we'll you the tools. It. Like, we've given yeah. you the pieces of Lego. It's all right. Yeah. And so what I wanted, and it's funny, again, this is another selfish thing, was I didn't create the identity system to begin with for other people. Yeah, I created it for so. me because I'd lost myself from all of what had gone on. And I was like, if I'm going to recreate my life from the ground up from a place of fulfillment, from internal love for myself and feeling amazing every single fucking day without a matter of what I achieve, because that's what I realized, achievement means nothing without the fulfillment because that's why we want to achieve. That's why we want the money or the car or the woman or the purpose. It's not the achievement. It's the feeling we get. So I was like, I'm going to reverse engineer. Or the perceived feeling that we think we're going to have, right? Like, oh, when I make it there, I'm going to be happy. I'm going to feel that thing, yeah. Like, oh, when I achieve that, I'm going to be happy then. You might get that for like two days and then it kind of wears off. You know, the new car feeling for like three weeks and it's like, oh, fuck. If we could live in that feeling every single day without the new car, that's a win because it's, you know, we work so hard for the new car to get the feeling. But if we, what if we could just have the feeling without it? That's kind of like the monk's leap. So I I guess in a way, like I brought the personal development stuff in with the near death experience and yeah. what I've learned from the monks and amalgamated it in this way. And, and so the, the, the system is set in a way, and I'm just talking openly about the system in that way. If people are listening on the podcast and you want more info, shoot me a message. Yeah. I've got a wait list right now for the way it's going to be launched out to the public is that we rewire. Most people try to rewire the subconscious, the identity through repetition or the doing. The thing is the most, leveraging thing or the most impactful thing in our subconscious mind is our emotion. If I said to you, tell me about, you know, that exam you sat in year 12 or in uni, whatever it is, or that thing you studied for for three weeks, and you put all of your focus and attention into it. Tell me about question number three. I don't fucking remember. I don't even remember the subject of the exam. But if I said to you, like to a parent who's had their child, tell me about, you know, when your child was born, tell me the color of the door handle in the room. Now tell me how many windows there were. They can tell you everything. Why? Because it's deeply ingrained in the nervous system, in the subconscious mind because of the heightened emotion. And so what I realized was like, okay, we're going to use heightened emotion, but not like a state of, you know, doing incantations every day, getting into that, that state, because even then it can be a conscious statement. If our subconscious doesn't believe it with proof and with belief in the, the actual doingness, then it won't sit. So we have a, a process where heightened emotion is linked in with a questioning. So rather than saying, I am, we can ask ourselves why we are that. And there's a reasoning process. So I won't go through the, there's a whole lot to yeah. the system, but yeah, of course. we use emotion and repetition in that way with these questions every sing, each day. But then what we do is, because again, who I am creates what I do. We, we work out what is going to set my ultimate fulfillment for my life. What do I want to feel? How do I not want to show up for, for, you know, in the world? How do I want to show up as myself, as for my family, for my partner? We get clear on that first. What do I do or who am I that creates my feeling of fulfillment? Okay, this is how I'm going to show up. And this is how I'm going to be. This is who I am. And then from there we go, okay, sweet. That's like going and do your three-day personal development event or your six, whatever it is. Yep. You've got the information, but how do you embody it? So then what we do is we have a tracking system, which all of your doing, your routines are set so that your subconscious is going, I did this today because, you know, I am this because I've done this. So it's like they then work together rather than one way. So then every time you do that thing, you go and you tick that box. Fuck yeah, that's exactly why I'm, you know, let's say it's a a multimillionaire, that's why I'm this coach or that's why I have this partner or whatever it is. Yeah, I tick that box again. I tick that box again. And what's actually happening is your subconscious is actually developing a genuine belief 
that this is who I am because I'm doing these things. Mm. But again, most people kind of have their conscious goal of what they want and then they have their subconscious actions and they don't align. This system is about bringing the two together so that there's no missing. And then that tracker is set in, you, do, you just do that every day, the items that align with your identity because it's all individualized, each person. My pro athletes want a completely different thing to me, but the guys that I'm healing in their physical body want a different thing to you know, the guys that we're saying from suicide. You know? So that, then we have a, a journal, which is set out in like it's set with your annual priorities, your quarterly targets, your monthly objectives. And then it links into breaking it down into weekly and daily so that you are on track every single day. I do these things today to get me on path with my week. I do this in my week to be on track with my month, my quarterly, and my annual, which we all know, you know, is a simple goal setting process, but very few people go and break it down that much or have it accountably set every day. Yeah, or linked to this Other parts. who I am or yes. like my values and to reinforce consistently like yeah, so th- I'm doing this and this is who I am or I'm doing yeah. this so it aligns to what I want to be or yeah. that that's wild. Yeah, and it's the whole like I said the whole reason for me was I know I'm put on this earth for a reason. I know I've gone through what I've gone through for a reason. How do I make sure I fucking live that? How do I make sure I don't get to the end of my days and go, you wasted your life. You nearly died when you were 25 and you still didn't fucking do anything about it that was to serve the world. I was like, how do I ensure I become this man for the world? And that's, I created the system for myself. Who do I want to be? Who do I want to show up as? How do I make sure I never, ever miss that mark? And this is who I am every day. And how do I ensure I'm on that path? I'm hitting my marks each day moving forward in that accountability. And there's that three-step process. All you do is if you do those three things each day, the, the questions, the tracker, the journal, it does, it, it does the work for you. It's the instruction manual of the Lego. And that's why I'm so passionate about it because I took a couple of guys through this the other day, two coaches, and – They've worked with very high-level coaches before, invested a lot of money as well. I said, I'm going to take you through this. You can't share this yet because it's all being trademarked at the moment so that it can be taken out properly. I took them through, and they were literally just sitting there at the end because they obviously understand the depth of it in that way. They were, like, speechless. They were like, that was it. That's what they were. They were just sitting there like, what That's a really good f-? impression, man. Yeah, and – they were like, what the fuck? How, how has no one else? They were literally asking yeah. the same, how has no one else discovered this? Yep. I said, well, I guess a lot it's of It's a good the- reaction, bro. Like that's every great idea I'm sure was reacted to that way. Yeah. Like, how, how the fuck have we not thought of a wheel before, you know? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's like, it's so simple, but yeah. we haven't. And that's why it's so effective because it is so simple. You just follow the instruction manual and that's where you get to. Because again, it's not about the doing. It's like, again, when you- when the things you do come from who I am, it's like, yeah. you know, the way you walk, I don't have to ask you about why you, you know, how you walk the way you walk. You're like, that's just the way I walk. Identity, you know, yeah. in that same way. And it, everything becomes so efficient because, again, the same thing. I achieved a lot at a younger age, but it was from a place of force and a place of effort and from, you know, it burnt me out. And I was like, how do I also ensure moving forward I can serve the world, but I never go back to where I was? I need it to be efficient. I need to be based on internal fulfillment, not achievement. That comes secondary. I need it to be in a way where it's trackable every single day and I can't miss my mark. And that's that's the, the word I use. I, I want to try and like get in the dictionary one day, unfuck up a boy, because <laughs> that's what it is. And that's I say it to the clients when they begin, I'm like, if you just trust this process, yeah. it cannot be fucked up. And what I've seen oh, so well, far, it's yeah. – and, and the most amazing thing is they're just like – when the fuck are you getting this out to the world? Like, that's what they say to me because they're like, if I'm getting this from where I've been, holy crap, what can it do? And that's that's where I'm saying like when I, the breathwork thing comes up, I'm like, yeah, you know me as a breathwork guy. Yeah. But that, you know, that's right now. This is what's going to change the face of the world. So the vision with this is coaching people through it so that they actually – and I've said to the coaches the other day, like how do I become an identity coach? Mm. Like that's, that's what I'm doing. I'm going to commit to that. I said, you need to do it first – to truly believe it. Because right now it's awesome information. It sounds amazing. It sounds like it's foolproof, but you need to live it and embody it to the point where you speak with my conviction. And then it's like, then you can coach it because you will come forth with such passion and such knowingness that I've done these things and this is where I am. It is unfuckupable. Then the people will be like, oh my gosh, that's when we're going to have true change. So, and I'll I'll, re- I'll quickly say, like uh, the people that are listening to this, other than myself and Glenn, aren't in the room. So I don't know what you're experiencing through uh, YouTube or through Spotify. But this man, this man, like 
I feel like I'm pretty good at talk, at like telling when someone might be bullshitting or or adding a little uh, <laughs> zhuzh to something, you know, like, and I, I'm probably good at it because I probably do it a bit too much and I'm trying to work on that, okay? No one's perfect, man, all right? That's all right. Well done. Hey, thank you, man. I'm trying. I'm trying. I just said it so I'd get some props from Todd. Uh, no, no, no. More no, like validation? I'm trying, trying to get better every day. I um, still need yeah. way too much validation to be happy. But Todd is fucking speaking with conviction and it, it is awesome. It is so cool to hear you speak about this, look me in the eyes and be so passionate about something because I've been passionate about something like that in the past and we've all been passionate about something and it, it is it is really amazing to hear you speak about that and not, and also be able to correlate that with some insights or some results you're already seeing from your peers yeah. that's beautiful and like what's more even more telling and and uh another uh caveat to this whole uh thing is that if you don't know who this man is like people talk about todd and, and it, it's it's always positive and People that like I've I've mentioned I I'm speaking to this bloke called Todd. He runs this thing on Sunday morning. Like oh that guy. Like I've heard about that. Or I'm going to that next weekend. Or yeah, like I know about Todd. Like it it's pretty. Like not many people, not many people like have that reputation or can say that. And you're in your mid twenties, and Australia is. We've got a lot of opportunity in Australia to 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 make some change and to do some big things and. Dude, I, I really appreciate you you coming and sharing. I, I need I would love to finish with just with one thing because um and I I'm not sure if you'd be able to like help me or provide uh, some insight be, because I feel like you you're tying a lot of your conscious success to this experience or to a few experiences. But like we we've all been sheep, we all are sheep. There's a lot of us that are still sheep and and like i feel like i'm i'm waking up and a lot of people feel that way right like is there anything that you could you could like say or provide or like share breath works obviously a massive one for me that i want to take more seriously now yeah but anything else that you would and i know like it's a lot of pressure it's one answer like don't honestly don't stress but i fucking love whatever comes to yeah challenge yeah yeah whatever comes to mind like uh how how can we get on our way to you, you know? And I'm not putting yourself on a pedestal, but... Um, straight on comment with that is I'm just a fucking country kid that yeah. fucked himself up and <laughs> had to learn the hard way. Like, that's the objective truth in that way. Yeah. Um, that's one thing I want anyone listening to know is, like, I have there's nothing special about me. You can do what I've done better because I did it the wrong way to begin with. Um. To know the difference between mindset and mindfulness because that's what nearly killed me. And that's, you know, a part of my purpose in life is to let people know there's a difference because if you and I have a race to climb a, you know, the skyscraper to get to the flag first and we start on the ground and we just, and I'm just pinning it. Yeah, i got the mindset. I'm the hardest work and I get to the top of the building and I'm like, what the fuck? And then I realise you're halfway up yours but you're on the right building, you've got the flag because you had the awareness to stop and look. I've done the hard work and I've, you know, quote unquote, stuffed it up. I, wouldn't, I don't really use that word failed a whole lot. It's more learning. But in this situation, you win because you're aware. And for me, I was like sitting in the, in the car doing 110, like, fuck yeah, killing it. I was like spinning the wheels with the f- nose against the wall. Like I was just burning out because I was doing all this work from the like Goggins mindset, yeah. but I wasn't actually aware of where it was coming from. And that's the biggest thing I wish, you know, I want because we talk about our pit becomes our purpose in life. Almost every person, well, at our, at our absolute core of a human, when we when we dig it down to the deepest in the psychology and the, the subconscious, we all want to help people. And you guys are doing this with the podcast and, and reaching out to, you know, reaching out to more people um, is that we all want to help. And so what I get people to do, because a lot of people don't know their purpose, and there's a lot of ways to ask it, but the one that usually lands most efficiently, because I can say, I do this with clients. I get them to go through a question setting. It's like, what, what is your purpose in life? What were you put on earth to do? You know, what is God's mission for you? If you had one thing you're supposed to do, what is it? And they're not sure. And then I say, what's one thing you've been through that you don't want anyone else to go through? And as a result, that becomes your mission. And it's almost every time people are clear, like I've been through that 
and I don't want that to happen to anyone else. So I would share this information so they don't make the same mistake. And for me, that was I had the mindset of a beast. I had no mindfulness, no awareness of what I was doing or why I was doing it. So if it was like actual implementable, actionable tools, number one, start breathing, the breath work. Um, If you haven't done Wim Hof before, that's the best one for people to start because it's so widely known. It's easily accessible. You feel a change in the body. Jump on YouTube, guys. Yeah. 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 So Wim Hof, and then you can go through from like beginner, intermediate, advanced. Then you can, if you want to lean into the holotropic breath work, which is, you know, the part that really shifted things for me, you can go to alchemyofbreath.com and they have a, it's called Breathe the World every Sunday at 6.30 p.m. I'm doing it tonight um, because that, that way I can have a space held for me. They, they guide you through an hour breathe. Um, breathworkonline.com, they have the same thing. They hold a free space, like a trial week, and obviously you can become a member afterwards. Same thing, Soma Breath, somabreathwork.com, same thing, because it's when you go into the deeper breeze, is when you feel the change in your mind, your spirit, your soul, who you are. Whereas with whims, it's more about a physical, I sure. feel lighter, I feel the tingling. So that's one, is definitely the the breath work. And then if there was a second thing, you know, meditation's in there for a lot of people, but it's easy to meditate after you've done breath work as well. So if you've ever struggled with meditation, because of breath work does what you want meditation to do. Yeah, it so mind. It's yeah. Mind, yeah. But really... Give yourself a little bit of time, gift yourself a little bit of time into your schedule to sit back and kind of go, just ask yourself questions because that's the ultimate way to coach. We don't coach by telling, we coach by the other person discovering the answer. So I just, you know, what I would recommend is sit with the journal and and write down a couple of questions like, am I living what I feel like, am I full in what I'm doing, you know? Is there any beliefs or anything that I'm holding on to at the moment that maybe aren't serving me? Is there an aspect of my life right now that I want more in that I'm not experiencing, which is huge for most people? And because within that is subconscious blind spots because, again, we all have conscious desires, but we very rarely, many people on earth achieve them because their subconscious conditioning is uh, in a different state. So it's taking that. I use journaling as my own coaching tool um, because once it's on paper, you can objectify it. There's no more mental BS story. Like you read it and you're like, what the fuck was that about? but that's what was going on in there. And once you, what I call it is you trap it on paper and then you can see it as it is. So journaling with questions um, is, is definitely a big part of that. And then I want to give one more cause I feel there's something coming through. Practice being present. And I don't say that was just like, you know, presence is a very butchered word at the moment. It's like a buzzword. But this identity system that I've created, it's the second best thing that I can imagine for the world. Number one is that everyone becomes like ego disillusion, which we talk about is like when the ego dissolves, which is what you have in that state of breath work because that frontal part of the brain is the ego, the thinking. When that dissolves, you're in a state of pure presence and bliss. And you can get through that from meditation, you know, through breath work, you know, people do it with psychedelics and things like that, but that state is the ultimate answer. That's what all of the enlightened sages of the years have said. It's that is that that space. And to me that presence is the ultimate answer. Because in presence there is never a fear of the future or a worry of the past or anything like that or sadness because you're just here and now. And that in itself is so healing. Because, you know, when most people break up they're not sad in the present. They're sad because what they lose for the future or what they've you know had in the past they no longer have. Or they lose a loved one. It's the memories that make them sad. When you come back to the present moment, it all disappears. And I had to use presence a lot in my health journey because I'd be worried about how I'd live for the rest of my life like this. I was like, no, it's only this moment that I'm experiencing this. And so it would be to you know, be with the breath during the day, but... When I say practice presence, what I mean is not just in the good situations or when you're feeling good. What I want you to really practice for those at home, and I invite you to do this, to challenge yourself, is when something shows up as a challenge and you start to get frustrated or upset. It's like there was a statistic, I believe. It's like around 90, I think it's like 94% of our negative emotions are based outside of the present. Yeah. There's only like physical pain 
Right? An emotion only lasts within our body for 90 seconds. Anything other than that is a mental story based on past or future. So I, I implement the 90 second rule, which is I allow myself to feel an emotion for 90 seconds and it's done because anything else is me holding myself in that pattern. Um, so when, an, um, when a challenge comes up, when you're having an argument with some someone or you're late for work or whatever it is, if you just come back to the present moment, you realize that what you're freaking out about of being late for this session or this is appointment or whatever it is, that dissipates because it's like me worrying right now isn't going to get me there quicker, but it enables me to be in that calm state to be here now. And that's actually also how we perform our best. The best athletes in the world do their best because they're not you know, one shot ahead or one corner ahead or behind. They're right here, right now. And that's 100% focus is here. When we're outside of the present, you know, there's five percent of our mind that's thinking about, oh, I got to, you know, winning the outcome, the winning, the championship, the title, the money. That's all it takes for you to miss that shot, miss that tackle, miss that rut, or whatever it is, and you lose it because you're not present. So presence is that answer, and that's where I say the the identity system is the second best thing. Because I, for a while, I was like, this is the best thing in the world. Then I was like, no, presence is, you know, enlightenment is the ultimate answer. But if, because I, for a period, I was going pulled to ordain as a monk. Because that's what I'm seeking ultimate freedom in my life. And I was like, does that really serve the world in the greatest way? And I was like, no, it's not. And if the world's not ready to all go and ordain as monks and become enlightened beings or whatever it is, you know, which is a big, you know, big thing for people to even think about, let alone actually comprehend and, and contemplate, is if we all have an ego, which we all do in this physical body, we can't break past the ego while this exists which is why, you know, in deep breath work and what you, you leave the body, your ego disillusion, ego death, because for that period of time, you're not in the body. You're not aware of it. I was like, if I can't get people to dissolve their ego, the one thing that is persistent in their life is their ego. But if we can recondition their ego, which is their identity, to actually serve them to live the life that they desire, that's the greatest like gift I can give to anyone other than the ultimate presence of enlightenment. So to trump the identity system in that way to begin with, your first step is to become present because then the pain, the worry, all of those things dissolve. So, Beautiful, yeah. man. Beautiful. And um, just some anecdotal evidence. Uh, I remember like as I started to progress in the corporate world, right, mm-hmm. I um, started meditating around the same time. Yeah. And uh, I used to chat to Glenn a little bit about it when I was doing it and I felt like um, I, I'm the, the one thing I could correlate as a benefit to meditating – uh, was that I felt like I had more control and whether this was a placebo or not, but in high stress conversations or situations, I felt like I was able to be conscious and be like, hang on, like what do I want to achieve here? Yeah. Rather Instead of just snapping. Yeah. And I feel like I've gotten better and better at that over the last few years, which I'm, yeah. which I'm really happy about. And something else I will say is that the more I disassociate myself with my ego the, the less tired i am to whatever this ego thing is yeah. the more i can see something that might be attacking my ego as a joke or something to giggle about or yeah. whatnot the the more content and happy i am overall yes. and i can see that as a progression from when i was 20 as i used the example before as this young just bloke who's just going right 110 yeah. days an yeah. hour you know uh, burning himself out but um so so it, it's cool to hear like mer- I, again i'm just sharing my experience yeah. but that I see so much truth to that sentiment. And I know a lot of people will, yeah. a lot of people will, but really appreciate the, the advice and the direction and the guidelines and, and Todd, man, thanks so much for coming and being here, bro. I had a wicked time. Thanks yeah. for spending the time. My pleasure. Dude, literally. Oh. And, and this setup, by the way, is fucking epic. Hey, I love God. that, dude. When my I walked God. in, I was like, oh, this is amazing. Don't fuck around here, and, bro. And, Up and, the and 15th, also, 15th floor of the, uh, the, what's that tower in the sunny coast that we're at? Sorry, no. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> and for, for anyone else that has a podcast that's listening to this, if you're not stepping your game up and asking what, the guys coming on want to like drink or snacks or whatever. You need to get it That's on. The least, <laughs> dude, I was the least blown you away. Can do, my yeah, <laughs> my man was like, well, you know, drinks or snacks, what do you want? I'm like, well, I'm on day five of a fast. I, I need coconut water. I rocked out with my own drinks. He's like, no, I got coconut water. I was like, this is a fucking living. How good is life? Doesn't oh. matter about the bills getting paid. All that matters is that Todd's happy and I'm fucking happy. <laughs> Now, nah, look, I had the best time. Thank you so much, man. I'm looking forward to the next doing this when they can start back up. And I'm looking forward to this. Look, Like I told you, my identity is the biggest problem in my life. I know it's, it's the same for a lot of people. And I'm excited to see what's next for you and, and what's next for the world, man. Yeah. Life's 
bloody interesting, eh? Life's incredible. That's what oh. it is. Like when it's Nelly taken from you, you appreciate it every single day. There's a statement I say to myself every morning when I wake up. It's, I am warmly and deeply appreciative to live life because, you know, we do take it for granted. And uh, we do, man. Yeah. If, if people are struggling in life in any way, people might think it's, you know, beliefs or values or actions. I just want everyone to know whatever you're struggling with in life comes down to your identity every single time. And, you know, if in 500 years time or 200 years time or something like that, there's a layer deeper than identity. I want that to be the thing for the world. But right now with where I'm at, it's like, this is the thing. And if you're struggling in life, know that almost always it is the identity. And that's what, you know, if you wanted to, if they wanted to jump on, if you guys listening wanted to jump on socials and whatnot, um, yeah, I'm sharing as much as I can about identity in that way. Yeah, yeah he, he does a, a lot of insight, a lot of uh, quick videos, some, uh, what is it, the carousels. Like, he, yeah. he's the king at Instagram, man. And, uh, yeah, we'll have all his in, info in the description for sure, but I can definitely second that. Yeah, thank you, brother. So I uh, appreciate you having me. Thank you, boys. I appreciate it. And, yeah, also for anyone listening, like, if you have any questions at all, please just hit me on Instagram. Like, send me a message and I'll audio message you back. Um, I always, always do that because I know- He loves an audio message. Yeah, hey, I was a bit uncomfortable the first time I audio messaged him back. <laughs> yeah, so it's just efficient. And yeah. That's the thing when you got a lot of messages, it's like, okay, da, 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 and you just go through. That's so, so true, man. So, but yeah. then I, you know, people can also hear my voice where I'm coming from as I'm saying it because a lot of the time it's like, they ask a question. I'm like, okay, that's a, you know, I'll say it. Like if I said it in text, that's a load of shit. Yeah. And then rah, 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 they're like, what the hell? But it's if I'm like, that's weird. a load of shit. And this is why, yeah. and this is what we're going to do about it. They, they get the feeling. Yeah, you can sense so, tone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. My oh, guy, oh. thanks so much, bro. Thanks, man. <laughs> Fucking love this, Chad. Thank you. Oh, how do we wrap up? Subscribe, follow this man. Follow this man. Subscribe to us. Uh, figure out your identity. <laughs> Buy this program like I will. And uh, we'll see you uh, on the next episode of Inside the Mind of. Thanks, Toddy. Thanks, Glenn. See you guys soon. Yeah. <laughs>